how do I get to a million dollars of crypto assets today without it being 50 years time? You don't call yourself a trader, but you do like three, four trades in a cycle or a year. What is it that makes you trade? I'm pretty sure it said cold storage only works if it's ideally never been connected to the internet. Yes. How does that work and how do I get my crypto onto something that's never been on the internet? I've seen you tracking the election coming up. What's going to happen? Do we get our money ready to buy in the dip or do you, are we going to the moon because they're going to back some crazy crypto thing that helps it explode? Yeah. Tell me. You want to get a train beer? All right, train is passed. All right, cool. I've been uh, excited and looking forward to this. We've been hanging out for a year, pretty regularly. And crypto, I never bring crypto up. I, I mean, I've learned to not bring crypto up just in general in life, unless, because I've, I've been through years where I did that pretty regularly. But also, I know you guys had a little crypto history of, of some kind. Maybe we'll get into that. Um, but beforehand, just like tell me, I know your names, but tell, tell the world your names, what your background is in maybe in investing or business and what brings you towards maybe reconsidering crypto. Mm. So Corin and Leanne Woodmas, both Australian entrepreneurs. Uh, we've traveled the world as you have as well, uh, building businesses and all that sort of stuff. Probably the last four years, we've been focused on cash flow investing. So this is where uh, you and I first met in Bangkok a few years ago. Mm-hmm. And I was talking about cash flow investing. I don't think you had a crypto thing at that time. But by then we were kind of like, we just were focused on cash flow only. And that's it. So yeah, that's the background. Um, cash flow investing full time. Yes. Uh-huh. Yeah. So uh, background is M&A advisory business brokerage. Mm-hmm. So we help people buy and sell businesses. And then we've bought a business ourselves. And it's been, that was a year ago, a year and a half now. And yeah, about four years cash flow investing. So most of our questions we will be comparing this to cash flow investing, which I know this isn't. Yeah. Um, or is yeah. it? Yeah, it might be. To add. I don't, yeah. We don't know. We got questions. Yeah. Lots of questions to ask. Sure. And I know you guys, oh, you work together. She's your chairman of the board and <laughs> your VP of marketing. I, is that? <laughs> something like that. Yeah. I sell, she delivers. All right. That's that's the easiest that's way to explain it. a good breakdown. It. So tell me then, what is it about life or the internet or something that's bringing you back to reconsider crypto? It's kind of a funny story. Uh, we were Googling house prices or real estate pricing in Prague two weeks ago, mm. three weeks ago almost. And because we're looking at investing in real estate in Europe, we do a bit in, in the US here. And on YouTube, just searching around, Came across uh, Leon Vankum's mm. talk at BTC Prague. Uh, we used to live in Prague as well. So that was the extra, oh, this is interesting. He's a property developer that builds real buildings and also has a crypto or Bitcoin strategy yep. that really made us stop and think, like, wait, wait a minute, because we're about to move some assets, some cash flowing deals. So like the capital's coming back basically and a few other things. So it's like, where else do we go next? Mm-hmm. So a few weeks ago, perfect timing, the market took a dip and uh, we, we started buying Bitcoin. Hey. <laughs> so there you go. Do you have anything to add? So Gubbs always talks to us funnily about crypto when he does talk uh. to us. And we're like, this guy can't be crazy. He's pretty smart. He's a pretty sharp guy. He definitely doesn't seem foolish with his money or his investments. So maybe we should start listening. We've definitely, not all of our investments have One, we've definitely had some losses. Crypto has been a loss for us in the past just because we had a cash requirement at a time and so we were forced to sell. I don't I think we were always planning to hold forever, but it didn't work out that way. And then when we lost, it was like this bitter pill that you, you know, had to swallow and it was it was harsh. But then okay, crypto starts becoming more interesting. It's fluctuating in a way that makes you see opportunity maybe friends are doing interesting things in this space and and talking about it in ways we've maybe never considered before Mm -hmm. so it's like why not try and see what's behind that what don't we understand and as investors we want to understand what we're investing in as best we can so that we can mitigate risk because we're not 
it's not a risk play. We're actually quite risk adverse. Mm. But I think now that there's a lot more adaption with crypto, it's probably less risky than a lot of people think because I think there probably is a base there now. Mm -hmm. uh, so interested to hear more from you on the positives and or maybe negatives sure. of, of the day in the life of, of being crypto. a crypto asset holder. A crypto bro. Crypto bro. Yeah, I know you wanted to say it. So, I love that you're rocking the Bitcoin orange glasses now too. Like you're all in. So I was biting my tongue and you guys were like, all right, Gerbs, we're ready to talk crypto. And I got so excited. I said, put together a list. And you did of questions. And I checked them out today. They're awesome. I, I want to go through all of them. To have noobish questions at this stage is like so to be expected. And I think I'm so like disconnected these days from people who are come, like seeing it with a fresh set of eyes that I've lost track of like what questions people have at the very beginning of their journey. You even mentioned to me, you're like, your website has so much stuff, but like, where the hell do I start? And I know that's a problem. Like, even I, I have a problem organizing it that way. Um, so I was very excited to like, kind of take a step back and go through this with you guys. So let's just bang through questions and see where we end up. So this is my question. The, uh -huh. How do I get to a million dollars of uh -huh. crypto assets today without it being 50 years time? Like, you know, I want it now. Yeah. So say my goal was like 20, 30. What would I have to invest today to be able to get to a million bucks of crypto? Like what is realistic and mm -hmm. what isn't? Because if I'm, you know, back in the day, you could put five or 10,000 in maybe and you get these 400x yeah. returns or bigger. Uh -huh. Is that still possible? Is that not possible? Obviously, the volatility isn't as like it was. No. So volatility equals opportunity. Mm -hmm. So what do you think? That's a super loaded question. Like, how do I go from uh, $100 to a million dollars? Let's go. I think about it a few ways. First of all, you said 2030. I, I don't think uh, the way I'd set like time frames is I just think like cycle to cycle. When I say the cycle, I'm talking about the halving event. Have you guys, are you familiar with the halving? Bitcoin's halving a little bit? When they're really Heard of it, yeah. Day one, when Bitcoin first started, there was zero Bitcoin. And the way it's designed is to issue 50 Bitcoin in each block to whoever mines the block. And a block takes 10 minutes. If it takes 12 minutes, it readjusts back to 10 minutes. If it takes eight minutes, it readjusts up to 10 minutes. So it's block time is always roughly 10 minutes and it, it adjusts, we call it block time. And so every 10 minutes, 50 more Bitcoin were issued to the miner who helped process all the transactions in the, that happened in the last 10 minutes. And those are new, those 50 Bitcoin are new Bitcoin that didn't exist before. It's an entry in the ledger that says, we got 50 more and they went to whoever processed those transactions for everybody. And every four years, the amount of Bitcoin that gets issued gets cut in half. And that's the halving. 2009, I think, uh, the first Bitcoin block happened. It was 50 Bitcoin for four years. Every 10 minutes, 50 Bitcoin were issued. And then in 2013, that got cut in half to 25 every 10 minutes. Now we're at, I think, three and an eighth Bitcoin. And when this happens, it creates a little bit of like a supply shock in the market because where all these miners were making 25 Bitcoin yesterday, now they're making 12 and a half Bitcoin the next day. And they, the, the miners, they usually have to sell a lot of Bitcoin in order to pay for their infrastructure and their electricity. So they're big sellers of Bitcoin. They're the ones who provide a lot of liquidity in the market. And so this halving event, it's programmed into Bitcoin. It's going to happen. We're at three and an eighth. It's going to be uh, that's a hard number, one and a half and a sixteenth or whatever, uh, in four years from now, it's going to keep happening until almost zero Bitcoin are issued every block. And that's in like the year 2140. And this is the way Satoshi like came up with, like, how do you create a new money? Who do you give it to? And how do you issue it from the beginning? And that's the system. And so it creates this four year cycle. And I mean, I can actually pull it up here and I'll, I'll show you guys. This is the chart of Bitcoin where the blue turns to red is the halving event. And so you can see every time the blue turns into red, we go into a bull market right after. That colorful line is the price. And so every time, here it is, within six months, bull market. Within six months, bull market. We just turned red again. We just had the halving again in April. And everyone knows this now. This is not like, insider information at this point but for some reason the market still questions it 
Now, past events don't necessarily dictate the future price, but this supply shock, it's going to happen again. So long way to say, I think of all of my goals in crypto, and I think part of your question comes into goals and whatnot, is I think in four-year cycles and where I, where am I in the cycle and what is my goal for this cycle right now? 2030? Mm, let's, let's save that for the next cycle, what your goal is for that cycle. What's your goal for this cycle, maybe? Maybe your goal is to just accumulate more Bitcoin and learn about it and not sell this cycle. And I think given what we've seen here, we should like kind of break out of the previous all-time high within by the end of this year. That's what's happened every single time. And based on this, we should have the top somewhere around the end of next year. And so if you have a, a goal within like about a year time frame right now, that's kind of how I'd be thinking because because of where we are in the cycle. Are we going to still see these like 100x returns all over crypto? Yes. Is Bitcoin going to 100x this cycle? Probably not. Is it going to 100x over the next five cycles? Probably yes. How to kind of construct your portfolio maybe if you're looking for a certain return, what, 100k into a million or something maybe as a an estimate? That's a 10x. And historically, even Bitcoin has 10x every cycle. That's a realistic thing. We can look Maybe from bottom to top, maybe not from like where we are right now to the top. We, I don't I don't necessarily see a 10x right now. It's it's doable. That would be 500k five, or 600k. It's doable. It's less likely. And each cycle, I think it's less and less likely to have a 10x amount. But leading up till this cycle, I've thought about each cycle as a 10x opportunity. How do you do it? You just buy the dips. And you average in slowly over time. And when you have the cash to buy more, you buy more. When you don't, you hold on tight because it's gonna be hard. It's hard to hold. Did I answer your first question? I went into a little yeah. a little tangent on this on the having though, but it's so fundamental to the cycle and the cycle is fundamental to investing in crypto. So is there a way to is there like a crypto calculator? that you can put in, I think crypto is going to do this. I'm going to buy 100,000 of Bitcoin. Mm. I'm expecting this multiple. Or is it just as simple as that? Do that sum in your head. Okay, if we're going to get a 100x or a 200x, like just do that math and that's what you can expect. Yeah. I mean, there's no calculator. It's like if I buy NVIDIA stock, is it going to go up? It's it's the same thought process. If I Instead, if I buy an index fund, will the market go up? Yes, but it'll be like the smallest amount compared to the large, it's a risk reward question. Buying an index fund, which you could spray and pray across crypto and have a ton of random tokens that you've never heard of, like little slivers of them. And you'll probably, it'll go up through, through a cycle. When it comes time to sell them all, it's going to be a shit show. There are some indexes that you could buy too. I wouldn't probably recommend. You, you could just, buying Bitcoin and ETH is like a good index, I think, for the crypto market. If you wanted to dive into a particular sector, uh, you'd do that a little differently. Um, but yeah, the math is just what I like to do in each cycle is have like a concrete goal, not a not a monetary goal, but like a thing I'm trying to accomplish in my life. So maybe it's I'm trying to buy a house, like a million dollar house. Well, I need a million two hundred thousand dollars because I'm gonna have to pay tax when I sell that million dollars of crypto. And then that's kind of I'd work backwards from that. And then when the cycle happens and the the chaos comes and everyone's rolling in the dough. You sell when you accomplish your concrete goal, not when you think you're going to magically time the top of the market because that's where everyone fails and then rides it all the way down. Lock in your goal and then who cares what happens after that? That's how I think about it. You've talked a few times about just making a few trades. You don't call yourself a trader, mm. but you do like three, four trades in a cycle yeah. or a year, depending on the year. What is it that makes you trade? Okay, there's probably like three or four types of trades maybe. The first is like, sometimes I need cash. You got to sell. Like that's the reality of the world. And do I try to sell at the best price? Yes. The way I would typically do that too is I'd just set a limit order, a sell price at a price that I think based on the chart where I think we could go because, it, and it'll probably do that while I'm sleeping. So I set a limit order to sell at that price and I hope that I wake up over the next week and it's happened. Sometimes I just need cash and I'll set a limit order for that. I also, I do, I trade the cycle is the way I describe it, which is I, I have like one big trade every cycle. I have some concrete goal that 
if I need a lot of money, like to accomplish some big goal, I'm going to average out of crypto at some, typically Bitcoin, because that's what I hold the most of, but I'm going to average out, meaning sell in a few chunks to hopefully lock in that goal that I've set. And I'll do like a big trade every cycle to hopefully accomplish that goal. One of the trades could even be try to sell a bunch of Bitcoin at the top of the cycle so that I could buy two years from now at the bottom. That could be a goal. So that would be like a trade that I might do. There's also just dollar cost averaging in. Like I use Bitcoin as a savings account. If I have cash, I just buy Bitcoin with it. And I'd rather hold Bitcoin in my wallet than, than inflating money at, in the bank's wallet. Do you hold the cash, the spare cash, in like a Coinbase account or something so it's ready to deploy? Or do you just buy? It, I guess it depends how much you have, but uh -huh. are you constantly buying regardless of the price? Or do you always try and like catch the bottom? Ideally, I try to catch the bottom. If I have cash in my, let's say I've, I've got money in my Coinbase account, it's never sitting as a balance. It's sitting as a limit order. I'll put in a limit order right now at like 40K because, hey, if I wake up one morning and Bitcoin is 40K and I magically bought it at 40K, I'm going to be stoked about that. So I never just have it sitting there. Typically, I'll have it like, where are we, like about 60 right now? If I see the chart says like, oh, we could go as low as 50 and I'm trying to buy more right now, I'll just have limit orders at like 50, 51, 52, 53, 54. And I'll just kind of spread them out and hope that they trigger while I'm sleeping. I never buy while I'm looking at the computer. It's just like a rule because the best time will never be in that moment. Like it's a proven fact. So it's always limit orders. And I guess the last sort of trade I do is I do some DeFi stuff, which is the next level. We'll get you guys into DeFi at some point here. But a lot of times I'm earning interest in random ass tokens and re rewards and these crypto-y things that I'll usually sell them for more Bitcoin or more Ethereum. So every month I have like a calendar event where I go and I farm all of my rewards and I trade them for tokens that I want to have. Oh, there's one more. There's a portion of my portfolio that's like trading, I'll call it trading narratives. I mean, even Bitcoin and Ethereum are a narrative. There's like the sound money narrative and there's the digital gold narrative. That, that would be Bitcoin. Ethereum is like, the global decentralized supercomputing platform narrative. But there's thousands of narratives in crypto. Everyone has some juicy idea about what they think the future might look like and they're trying to build it. And I have like 10% of my portfolio is just investing in narratives. An example might be like DeFi is just a great narrative. Do we think borrowing, lending, trading, all the things that banks do now are gonna happen on blockchains instead in the future? Like, hell yeah. Well, compared to you, we talked about this a few weeks or months ago now. Uh, we were trying to get a cash out refi on our properties. Uh. We hadn't owned them long enough. We bought them with cash. And then the interest rates bumped, mm -hmm. like spiked six weeks. We were late, basically, Yeah, um, which you can't control. But you're like, oh, I just got a loan yeah. the, the other day. Super easy. Like, no questions, bam, done. Yeah, it's like four clicks. And that's the future of this. And especially once your home is tokenized, you can borrow against that. Like right now you can only borrow against like Ethereum and some other assets and we can talk, we'll talk borrowing at some point, but borrowing against physical real world assets is coming and it's going to be a major unlock. So that's a perfect narrative. So that would be as part of this kind of, for me, it's a 10% bucket, depending on what your risk profile is. It might be higher or lower. That's a great narrative. And what you would do is go chase down every freaking rando in their basement building borrowing against real world asset tokenized tools and see how to invest in it maybe they have a token maybe it's an opportunity that you can invest in and then spray across them well that that kind of speeds up the token question because yeah. uh we're primarily credit investors which means we lend as a pool of investors we lend capital to companies projects etc mm -hmm. that's where most of our cash flow investing comes from yeah so once that's unlocked that's going to be ridiculous big deal yeah when you can link real world with this yep. versus cutting out banks and the rest that's very interesting yeah it's already doing it i'll show you i actually pulled that up because i knew this would be like an example that you guys would be into this is called the real chain i just heard i heard about it recently i haven't done a lot of due diligence on it 
but it's a real world asset chain. This is something that they're doing. They've tokenized gold bars, just as, a, as an example, right? Where these are custodied, I don't even know. They've fractionalized and tokenized gold bars, as an example. They've also done it with all sorts of real estate properties. And this is like a platform for tokenizing real world assets. I think at the moment, they're still early. Like it's not very, let's call it, it's not very permissionless. So you got to talk to them, set up an account, but then you can like invest in tokenized real estate and you can hold those tokens. But you'd kind of want that because it's the internet. Maybe at first. I, I own yeah. this building over here. Uh -huh. Yeah, sure you do. Yeah. <laughs> right? So this is the hardest part about when real world meets blockchain. Like digital assets, if you say you own it, like we can prove it with cryptography. Physical assets, I need to see your deed. Like there's no way around that. However, like, did you guys hear that California, they minted NFTs of every vehicle in California, like license and registration is on chain now. I could see like a municipality or like a city putting all of the deeds on chain and making that like verifiable. That's a side question. So I actually think that's more interesting than this is what's kind of held me back from crypto mm -hmm. is I think that's more interesting utility. Mm -hmm. But why does that mean this thing is worth more? It's kind of like if you're a public company, then there's a value to your company by minute mm -hmm. when the exchange is open. Sure. But why does that instantly mean this has value? I don't think it does instantly mean this should be more valuable than something else. Sure. It maybe doesn't mean it's more valuable. It's just interesting. And it's not just interesting either. It, it unlocks potential that didn't exist. Like um, you guys have dealt with like international banking troubles. I'm sure in your life, you guys are from Australia. All of this kind of can go, can go away. Like if it's permission, anyone in the world can invest in real estate. Like, so they have this UK real estate fund. So this is like the, the next example. This is eight properties with a projected 12.8% uh, interest. And somewhere it even broke down. I think it included 5% of asset appreciation and 7.8% of rent earnings. They also are issuing 42% in RWA tokens. This is a very common theme in crypto where they've got a token. They're to early users of their platform, they're slowly issuing it out. As the value of their token increases, the percentage goes nuts. So why haven't you done this? Because it seems to me from the outside, yeah. this is where the money is. Um, like create this is something so of value. New. It's and so new. Add a, no, no, but add a coin, Oh, yeah. your own coin on something. So why doesn't BitLift have its own coin? Um, I don't know. I haven't gone down that rabbit hole. I haven't built a business out of BitLift. I haven't built a business in crypto, actually, why at not? all. Why not? Um, Let's do it. Yeah. He doesn't want to do it. I'm should tell less, us something. I'm less hungry to build any business these days. That's why. That's that's fair. Yeah. <laughs> Businesses are hard, man. Investing in crypto, it seems easy to me, maybe because I've been doing it for a while. But yeah, I don't I don't want a business. I don't want a token. I don't want investors breathing down my neck. The guys that are running this, the, they're working their ass off. And they should. This is a, this is a big deal. Yeah. As as you've identified, like like he's like this is really fucking cool. It's very early too. Like we've seen a lot of blow-ups in crypto. So like how early to get into things and how to do proper due diligence on these types of things. I'm sure you guys have done deals where doing due diligence is really hard in the real world. There's no crypto component at all. And doing due diligence is a nightmare. Well, now you add this on top of it, it can be scary. But this return, it might maybe it's worth it. Up to you. But anyway, I just wanted to show you like some of the things that are going on in the real world asset realm. I know that's like something you guys are going to be interested in. Rabbit holes you're going to go down for sure. So on this theme of crypto and lending, mm -hmm. how does that work for you personally? Yeah. So I know that you've done it recently. Sure. And we've been talking about, okay, so maybe when you first thought about taking your loan, the price was this much, and mm -hmm. then like this happened. Yeah. Are there like stop loss calls that have happened to you or, or limits that got triggered or anything? Like how does the whole lending thing work? I'm like, yeah. You have to pay that back with cash or are you waiting for your Bitcoin to increase in value and then you just pay this guy back in Bitcoin? Like, how does that work? Uh, all of those things are true. So this is Compound Finance. This is one of the biggest kind of decentralized platforms in crypto lending. And they have these different markets. So you can borrow. This is on, on the Ethereum blockchain. 
You can borrow USDC, which is Coinbase's stable coin. You can borrow it against Ethereum at 4.77%. Um, you can also lend your ETH to this protocol and earn 4%. And this is actually breaks down to, it says net interest rate because as with most crypto -y things, there's a token involved. The interest is actually, it's 5.14% to borrow, but they, they give you 0.36% of compound of their token as a reward for using the platform. So a lot of these platforms, they're going to, they reward their users. That's always a, a theme you're going to stumble across a lot. Who calculates this? Do yeah, this like, is an algorithmic who, calculation. The bonus piece? Uh, yeah, actually it is. Um, it's based on um, how much of the token they have decided to issue over a given time. And then what, what's the utilization rate of the protocol? Uh, utilization, 72% of the available USDC is currently loaned out. And it, see how it's super flat here. This is the rate. As it starts to reach, what is this, 90% utilization, it just goes parabolic to avoid that from happening. Because they never want to loan out 100% of the money. Maybe it's like for safety or, or whatnot. But yeah, it's an algorithmic, constantly adjusting thing. And maybe the amount of tokens that are allocated to this borrowing pool, that might be voted on by the DAO. And the DAO is just, it's the shareholders. Everyone who holds compound, the more compound you hold, the more votes you can have. And maybe who owns compound is even like, a protocol themselves like this was borrowing on ethereum but this is borrowing on optimism which is a different chain i noticed here to borrow on optimism is negative they're currently paying you to borrow ethereum on optimism so for whatever reason that's happening and that's an opportunity and it's a quarter of a percent so based on your risk and what you want to do with that is it worth it maybe but it's interesting right when it comes time to actually borrow I'm not connected to my wallet or whatnot, but um, in this dashboard, so you deposit collateral. You can deposit wrapped Bitcoin or Ethereum. You can even deposit staked Ethereum. So you can be earning interest on your Ethereum while you're borrowing against it. Uh, if you ever borrow against Ethereum, always borrow against staked Ethereum. I and then they the take the lot if it drops below a certain threshold. Right, and then it's up to you to determine your threshold. It'll tell you actually and it'll tell you what the threshold is let's go back to ethereum usdc here it is so if you're borrowing against ethereum you can borrow up to 83 percent loan to value ratio you would never want to borrow 83 percent because you'll get liquidated really quick so and it'll get liquidated at 90 percent loan so, to value ratio so can you top up or is yeah, that absolutely. automatically just cuts you off so you if you're on up. vacation, for example, yeah, and your LTV gets whack, so you're probably like down at 50% or something to be mm. super safe. Yeah, I'm like 30. Safe. Okay, even, yeah, because you don't want to lose your yeah. your collateral. Okay, never. Yeah, but if that triggers while you're on vacation, say, what's the time limit between you topping up with more ETH, cash, whatever, so you don't lose your collateral? Or are you screwed? Is, is it just gone once it hits up? Just no more vacations. That's really the, <laughs> the only way. This uh, is really a lifestyle business. Yeah, lifestyle, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, so flash crashes can happen. Like I said, I'm so, I, 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 I do this at such a low loan to value ratio that like, I'm not concerned about this. I also, I look on the chart and I see like at what price, what, what price is not even possible and that's where I borrow. So like, I think with Ethereum, I determined that like $800, like we're not going to $800. So I only borrow enough to the point where ETH would have to be $800 for me to get liquidated. And then I think what happens, every protocol is different. This is Compound. There's also Aave. There's also MakerDAO. There's a bunch of them. They're all coming at this borrowing process differently. I'm pretty sure they liquidate half of the position. Might have to double check that. And it's when it reaches the liquidation factor, which is 90%, right? And then with MakerDAO, I, I'm, I'm almost sure there's a 24 hour period with Maker where it's been flagged for liquidation, but you have 24 hours to top up if you want to, or repay if you want to. Uh, and those are your options, right? You could just repay the loan or you can just top up more collateral. And then how does actual payment work? Do you, do you just break off a bit of ETH to yeah. pay? 
the equivalent totally. and that's part of the transaction. And so you, you hope it goes up in that time so that you yep. don't lose any ETH. You can just pay them what you've made maybe while you are doing something with it. Yeah. Yes. So I definitely, I want my collateral to go up in value because then my loan to value just gets safer and safer and safer as I wait. I could also just, as it goes up, pay down the loan if I wanted to along the way. But you're paying down the loan with ETH. So if, like, even though you're lending against the ETH, you're paying with ETH too at some point? No, I'm bar whatever I'm borrowing, that's what I'm going to pay it back in. So if you're borrowing cash, you're paying it back cash. Yeah. So I just, I could sell some of the ETH or whatever I'm doing with it to earn interest. I could and you can swap between these things very easily, but you just have to pay back in the same token that you borrow in. I'm trying to think of an example. Well, you mentioned you're buying a house for a million dollars before, mm -hmm. and we talked about this a few weeks back, but let's say you want to buy a house for a million dollars. Yeah. When are you liquidating crypto to get enough fiat to go buy a house versus lending? So in that million dollar example, you'd need what? Basically 10 million. To buy it. To, that would be a 10% liquid yeah, LTV, not, right? Not quite. Yeah. What, what yeah. would that be like? You need seven, you need seven six eight. and a half million. Yeah, yeah, something like that. Yeah. Okay. To keep that very safe loan to value ratio. And I mean, to be honest, I'm not buying real estate with my borrowed money. I'm just not. And I, I actually, I'm not doing very long term either. I'm usually bridging. I'm just like, I have no cash and I need to paint my house. Like, that's why I'm using it. The other reason that most people are using it is to lever to do leverage. So one of these markets on here wasn't to borrow a stable coin. It was to borrow more ETH. We talked about how Optimism is paying 0.27% to borrow Ethereum. So something you can do here and something people are doing with billions of dollars in crypto is borrowing ETH, staking it, taking that staked ETH, making it collateral, borrowing more ETH, staking it, and looping that. Right now, it's literally paying you to do it. So it's like if crypto was like just a very safe place to hang out, everyone would be doing this. Train beers are coming. Train beers. I feel I feel the energy. Oh no! It's good. All right, but we'll we'll uh, we'll pivot the conversation while the train comes by. You want to get a train beer? Yeah. I think something important with this though is that these are DeFi protocols. I think Coinbase had to legally turn off their lending program. So like right now you guys are using an exchange, you your money's there. That's a safe place until you figure out um, this stuff. But at some point we'll get it onto your own wallet so you can access these protocols. They're like two totally different worlds. Coinbase is a bank. Any exchange you use like that will is is like you're holding your money with someone else and you can't you, you can't access any of this while your money is tied up in that thing. Well, that's a really good segue. So we yeah. do have a ledger uh -huh. wallet. Cool. But I read on your one of your blog posts about securing your crypto. Yeah. That you said, and I don't understand this. Okay. <laughs> Bear with me. I'm pretty sure it said cold storage only works if it's ideally never been connected to the internet. Yes. How does that work? And how do I get my crypto onto something that's never been on the internet? Have you written your words down on your from your ledger? Have you set up your ledger yet? Yes. You, yeah. And you've got your 24 words written yeah. down. They're locked away. Locked away. Okay, good. Your ledger has never connected to the internet. It's the purpose of that device. It doesn't have an internet chip. Mm -hmm. So so there's like an app or an interface. Your computer has the, the interface. You plug your ledger into your computer and they communicate over that cable. What's on your ledger, the private key that was generated, it was generated on the ledger. It's never left a ledger. It's not capable of transferring over that cable. That's what you want, and that's good. So you have cold storage. You've got it set up, and that's a great thing. So You're, even though the cable yeah. is connected from the ledger to the computer, and yep. the computer is connected to the internet, yes. it is not connected to the internet. Correct. Your ledger is not connected okay. to the internet. See, that just sounded confusing. I'm like... I agree. Normally when you plug something in, it feels like it's connected, right? Yeah. Like, and then they came out with a new ledger that has Bluetooth, and you're like, wait, what the fuck? The whole point of this thing is like, I'm trying not to do that stuff. As says Ledger, the private key is in a very safe part of that device, and it will never leave that device. It can communicate over the cable and via Bluetooth some information, but not the private key, which is those words that you wrote down, and it's very safe. The next step is to lock down your words even better someday. We can go into that at some point. 
but then also we'll connect your ledger to an interface so that you can then interact with some of these protocols like Compound. I heard you talk about, or I read rather, uh, the stamping thing, the the metal phrase. So you, yep. you just told me before we hit record, or maybe yeah. we were recording, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, with the letters. So yeah. it comes with letters, you can build your own. Yep. And you mentioned sending that to someone else in a different state that you trust. I did? Or part of the phrase or something. And uh-huh. Like, I'll never, I'll never ask for this over the phone, only in oh, person. Oh, sure. Yeah. So if we're traveling a lot, how many of these should we have? Like, should we just have them in safety deposit boxes around the world? Or there's I'm all sorts of. So. I don't uh, know. Here, here's the fun part. No one will ever tell you how to do this because it would be them disclosing the way that they do it. However, there's a few like primitives that you can like use to come up with a strategy that makes sense to you guys. The first is you gotta stamp your 24 words in metal. That's just like fire flood. There's this guy, Jameson Lop, who like takes a blowtorch to all, he, he buys them all and then he like does a review of them. He like takes a blowtorch to them. He like tries to smash them with a hammer to like test their durability. Most of them are pretty good. The thing that you want to do is th- there's one extra layer that you can add, which is called a, a passphrase, which I think is important to use. It adds, think of it like a 25th word and that you can just remember or you guys can both know it. And you could even tell someone in another place maybe what the passphrase is. And then if someone ever was to stumble on your metal 24-word thing and they punch it in, they wouldn't know the passphrase. So I think together you can come up with a good scheme of how to do that. And I can help you with it. When we're not recording. Sorry for bringing it up. No, don't be. It's really important and people have a lot of questions about it. It's a weird... This is the part that Derek's app sets to fix do i trust his solution to making that to fixing that i don't know but is that can that be problematic yeah that can be problematic too the protecting your words and your passphrase and your geographic distribution that can be tricky too so it's like 2016 your husband gives you this piece of paper with a bunch of words scribbled on it and says don't lose it lose this and I'm like, I don't even know what crypto is at this point. Uh-huh. Apparently, we got given some ETH. Lost. I, got lost. I, oh. I earned that. It was a consulting fee. Damn it. <laughs> ETH was at 200. Gone. And I know with the, how much these guys pay you per hour, it must have been a lot of ETH. Back then, it was less. But still, <laughs> it would have been, I'd prefer to have it than not have it. It, w- it would have been nice. <laughs> of course. Yeah. One of I'm, many, right? Everybody's lost something, right? Yeah. And that's the thing, too, is that all these stories you hear about like the landfill that like has some some computer in it where the guy's Bitcoin are in there. Like this is because these assets, they weren't valuable yet. No one knew what they were yet or how to use them yet. Once you know like the value of this, you're not going to screw it up. People just they read these headlines in the news about how hard it is to protect your crypto and everyone's losing or getting robbed. And that's just not the reality of it, especially today. Can I tell you a real story about a bank? Please. So we've talked about this, but I feel like this gives context for Mm. what you just said. And this is probably why one of the reasons we didn't go heavy into Bitcoin at 3000, which is what Leanne was just talking about. So we were living in Prague. We're Australian citizens, as you mentioned, we're living in Prague. I was getting paid in USD. We had a, a Czech bank account with USD and crowns, which is the Czech currency. Not to hedge or anything, we just kept most of our money in USD in the USD account. Sure. I got an email one day and it says, due to factor rules changing that we will not comply with, we're just refunding all your USD. What is that? Refunding? So How does that work? We don't want your money. We don't, we're oh. not holding USD anymore. You got to transfer it out. And it said, you have to come into the branch and we'll give you cash. Cash? That's the only option? We'll give you cash. That was it. So I'm like, shit, this is They have all of USD money. cash? Yeah. Well, huh. well <laughs> you're jumping ahead here. Oh, all right. Like, so that's not possible. So Prague back then was a pretty cheap place to live comparatively to what we were earning. So we had probably a couple days in crowns in our crowns account, most of it in USD. So I got this email, I'm like, oh, okay. So I call up, hey, I'm coming down at 2 p.m. Yeah, no worries. I get to the bank, and they say, oh, we're out of, we're out of US dollars. I say, I, I don't care. Give me 
Yeah. My US dollars. You're the reason I'm here in the first Where place. Where do I need to go to get my US dollars? Yeah. They said, because of what just happened, there are no more US yeah, it's dollars. It's a run on the bank. They caused it. There's literally no more USD in the in the city, which is bonkers. Uh-huh. I go home. I don't remember this exactly. Maybe you could give us some perspective. But I remember coming back and just being, like, to your point about the phrases and holding custody of your own cash mm -hmm. versus this. Yeah. We were in a, a well-trusted national bank, not a multinational bank, and I couldn't access my cash. Yeah. And when I got home... I was then thinking, hey, do I need to ask a friend for some cash? You rent oh, you in like a week or something. Uh -huh. And we just didn't have the rent money on us because we only bring it down when oh, we need to right. pay. Sure. And then I was like, we're going to default on our rent. <laughs> <laughs> That's kind of crazy. Yeah. And our rent back then was like six or 800 bucks a month or something. So uh -huh. it wasn't huge. Yeah. But like when all your money is frozen. It's scary. And in one place. Why do we give it to them? That's the question. So that they can protect it for us? Like, we live in the future now. Like, well, there's so many better ways to do this. Anyway, that's interesting. That's crazy. And maybe it started to get you thinking about Bitcoin at that point. Is that what you're... Well, not yet. It was yeah. still, like, you're always looking at the risk factors. Yeah, the volatility. So then it was like, oh, let's go for a bigger bank. Mm. And when we came to the US, like, let's... We started with Wells Fargo right before they had their um, holding cartel money issue I oh don't know sure remember that. oh every bank we went has to been chase. through this i mean of course they did on yeah. some level whether they know it or not they're yes. holding cash for they sure are a lot of people so let's talk about what are the best use cases for mm. this right so sometimes you got to pay for stuff in cash you yeah. need cash but like what are the handful of awesome ways that you can actually use crypto today great question crypto bitcoin all of them just in general. I mean, like you mentioned the blockchain doing the like VIN numbers or license plates uh, sure. and stuff. Uh -huh. You know, that's an interesting way. But like I've got a wallet full of crypto. Mm -hmm. How can I use, use it. it to fund my life? Uh huh. To fund your life. Or to pay um, for things or to yeah. like not have to exchange it to fiat. So this is when I've got into crypto, this is I thought crypto was for payments. That's I come from an e-commerce background. I wanted to use Bitcoin for payments. That was the unlock. And I think even Satoshi, like the word payments shows up many times in the initial white paper. This was the original vision for it. And over time, especially since the invent of stable coins, a lot of crypto payments stuff has fallen to the wayside. All of the Bitcoin I've ever spent, I don't regret spending my Bitcoin. However, if I hadn't spent any of my Bitcoin, I'd be a lot better off. And that's what everyone has seen across the board. So it would be like spending the best investment you've ever made. Why would you do that? You spend like the cash when you have that laying around and you keep every, as much as you can in the investment. So we've sort of like crypto as a whole has kind of shifted to more of that kind of way of thinking. Doesn't mean there's not use cases for crypto anymore. Just like the payments one isn't there. Even like remittances. So like sending money internationally. I still do it in Bitcoin all the time. And then I replace that Bitcoin. It's called spend and replace because I never want to get caught spending on my Bitcoin and then it freaking goes nuts. So I will like, let's say I have to pay someone $500. I will buy $500 of Bitcoin and send it to them. That's using Bitcoin. I don't, I wasn't holding 500 in Bitcoin before that moment. I just used Bitcoin as a tool for transferring it from this country to another. So it's super, it's amazing for that. Especially the larger the quantity, or the larger the amount you're trying to remit, the better of a tool it is. It just costs like pennies to send any amount, billions, if you've got it, to the other side of the planet within 10 minutes. There's nothing else like that. So that, that's like a killer use case. The next ultimate killer use case, and there's, we always talk about use, killer use cases in crypto. When's the next killer use case going to come? And like, what's it going to be? I still think self-sovereign money that you hold the keys to i don't know if there'll ever be a better use case than that this idea of that bank issue you went into or like imagine as you just accumulate more and more over your lifetime it becomes scarier and scarier to let anyone else hold on to it and if you've got a good like system that you've designed for stamping your seed in metal and like protecting it that you've know like you know everything about that man screw the banks man we don't need them anymore
So that'd be the second. The third would be DeFi. Or actually, maybe stable coins have become like a major use case. This was my biggest, the unfortunate reason why I ended up getting in Luna last cycle was because I knew and still agree that stable coins is one of the biggest opportunities in crypto. And there was a big stable coin angle to that platform, which is why I was invested in it. I think lending too, man. Lending like if you can I know. hold the hold the collateral. Yes. So we're investors in a couple of deals where mm-hmm. there was supposedly collateral. Mm-hmm. When everything went to shit, I hope we can swear here. <laughs> when everything do. went down, there was no collateral. Yeah. But if you're holding the collateral and someone's at a thirty percent LTV, mm-hmm. I'd do that deal all day. Yeah. And yeah. So I, I mean, I said I was like trying to swap uh, stable coins and DeFi, and DeFi is. Borrowing and lending and swaps. That's like 90% of decentralized finance. It's basically, re- DeFi is just defined as like reinventing the banking system. But then how do you work on the trust issue? Because there's been a lot of theft yeah. in anything crypto because there it has. is so decentralized, no names, etc. Yeah, you've, I'm sure, heard of the term smart contracts. They're programs that live on the Ethereum blockchain or on any evm based chain which is a chain that can handle smart contracts the longer these contracts exist on these chains and are used the more hardened they become over time it's like the lindy effect it's like the longer something exists and hasn't been hacked the less likely it becomes to get hacked in the future and at this point the honey pots are big right they've got billions of dollars i think we saw on here somewhere that there was a billion dollars in compound protocol as collateral total supply 1.88 billion earning 790 million borrowing 560 million so like if you're a hacker this is a good place to hang out and it hasn't happened we are now you know four years ago eight years ago it was a mess all these things were getting hacked but they've really gotten a lot better over the years and do i use like the hot new kid on the block to borrow large amounts of money now? Hell no. Will that new kid, like, do they have some new innovation that could, like, completely change the game forever? Yeah, maybe. But also, they, these guys could, a compound could adopt that new thing. Or they could just stay the way they are and people like that too, being conservative, right? So I agree. Borrowing and lending is massive. Once, once we get different collateral, so right now it only happens against crypto collateral. Right? Yeah, one says buildings. Oh, yes. man. My brain's going nuts. It's I'm going to have to changing. stop talking soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I agree. It's a killer, killer use case. And let's talk like tokenizing equity. Killer use case. Like the fact that we exchange stock certificates between like only institutions that are like vetted to do so. Like it's it's weird. Like when you buy Apple stock, like where is it? Where is it? No one can even answer that. You could call your broker and they can't even tell you where it is. So having tokens under your control, it's a big, big deal. You can do streaming payments with crypto, which is another cool like innovation that's happening. People haven't, I remember when I first got into Bitcoin, there was talk of like someday autonomous vehicles are going to be transacting with each other to determine whether they want to like pass each other on the road. It's going to be like a micro penny to this car to allow this car to pull in front of it. And like, it just unlocked so many like, it made me realize how little I could, how, how uncreative I am about what we could do with this stuff. NFTs, they get shit on a lot because they're silly monkeys, JPEGs. But when you think about like concert tickets, for example, which is owned by a mega monopoly, I could buy a ticket directly from you. You could hold the ticket in your wallet. This is like game changing stuff that did, couldn't exist before. So there's just some some killer use cases I know there's a crypto credit card. Mm. Like, are people using their crypto to pay that off? Or is that just like a regular credit card and they pay it with cash? There's a lot of innovation happening there because the Visas and MasterCards of the world are finally getting more comfortable with this stuff. MetaMask, which is one of the biggest wallets companies, they just announced last week that they've partnered with a bank to issue the MetaMask debit card. And you hold Ethereum and stable coins in your wallet. And when you swipe your card, it converts it on the fly no more like having a checking account over here and a savings account over there or only having enough money to pay your bills and then like pulling from your investments that to for liquidity it can just pull from your investments 
like every time you swipe and that could change things. But it sounds like it's better to have your buy and sell limits to actually maybe make your fiat to pay those bills rather than just do it on a one-to-one -one transaction because you're paying the market rate at the time and it could yeah. be like the high to be buying a Coke or yeah, a beer or something. Yeah, it could be shit timing. Yeah. Or yeah. the low and then you, you're overpaying. Yeah. I mean, if I could just have all my money in Bitcoin and then like swipe my debit card, I would probably do it. What is it like? It's something like some Warren Buffett thing where like you just never disrupt compounding, like even for a millisecond. It's like the secret to it, right? And I feel like we'd be better off if we didn't have to disrupt our compounding. Now, is it compounding down sometimes, right? Have you delved into whole life insurance much? No. So it's a tax protected vehicle. You can you basically can put money in there. Mm -hmm. It's protected from tax. It's allegedly a guaranteed rate of return, and you can lend against it usually yeah. less, ideally less than your interest rate. Yeah. So if you go get a deal over here that's doing higher, you can like kind of like what you're talking about with compound here, like tripling up your investing. Basically, I've been pitched on it before. Well, you said allegedly. That's where I stood too. I think everything's allegedly, man. Like, come on. <laughs> Not in crypto. It's truth. It's it's on chain. Like, it's, it can't be any other way. It's just code. It doesn't make decisions or, like, file for bankruptcy. Well, even T-bills, like mm -hmm. Warren Buffett. Hmm. Has been think, more of them than anyone. Yeah, the last time, I think it jumped, like, $100 billion in the last couple months, maybe. So he just over, sold half his Apple position, right? Yeah, and yeah. put it into T-bills. Yeah. But I'm like, who says that that's risk-free it is everyone says it's uh, risk hold on that there i well, think there's a difference money. there yeah but they are the, the money. money supply is going down so your mate brian was talking about this yeah like what was his peg was 13 percent per annum or something uh, to keep up with inflation that's uh -huh. like oh right keeping it zero yep yeah so, so like, t-bills are paying five and it's like that's not making money that's losing eight percent according to brian yeah and according to the the numbers Bitcoin itself doesn't cash flow. It doesn't. But that doesn't mean that crypto doesn't cash flow. There are ways to make it cash flow. Yep. Obviously, staking and this kind of thing. Yep. But what are the best ways to actually make some cash flow off your assets? Cool. Without losing your ass. Yeah. Without losing your ass. That's the, the, the hack or the trick. I think just like in traditional finance... Lending money is the primary way of generating cash flow on financial assets, not physical assets, like uh, renting out your real estate would be a physical asset, renting that out. It's sort of like lending. You're lending your apartment to someone for six months or a year. I don't know. Just had that thought. But yeah, lending in some way. Sometimes you're lending to people. Sometimes you're lending to protocols that pool capital and then lend to individuals and have safety parameters in place. Like, like that's how Compound works. You're not lending. It's not like P2P. I'm not lending my money to a person. I'm putting it in the protocol. Anyone can come along and borrow from that protocol. Staking is you are lending your money to the network to help secure it. So that's Ethereum's security comes from its stake. Uh, Bitcoin has proof of work, which is like burning electricity in order to protect it. And Ethereum ha was that until two years ago. Um, Ethereum worked the same way. It was electricity and they, they change it to proof of stake because it's better for the environment. And whether it's better for security or not, that's a huge topic of debate in crypto. But you lend it to the protocol to help secure the protocol. The more money that is locked up in the protocol, the harder, the more you'd have to have to hack it is the way that that, a simple way of maybe, an oversimplified way of thinking of proof of stake. So right now you can earn like three and a half percent staking your ETH. You can also like, stake your ETH and then do what's called liquid staking. It's staked, but they give you a token that's worth the same amount as ETH and it's pegged to the price of ETH. So if I've got 10 ETH, I can stake them and then it's earning three and a half percent. And then, I, but I'm, I'm holding that token and then I can re-stake it uh, maybe with a safe collateral, a safe loan to value ratio. And I can loop that up to about 10%. That would probably be like a degen, uh, de Degen is de for degenerate investment opportunity in crypto. The next is like you can loan. So all of these exchanges, we call them DEXs or decentralized exchanges. Coinbase is a centralized exchange. But just like Compound, 
Compound uh, is to is to borrowing what like Uniswap is to trading. And it's a decentralized Coinbase is maybe a way of thinking about it. It works a little differently. It doesn't have an order book, which is like people placing orders and then, then matching people together. It uses a different system where anyone who wants to provide liquidity to the decentralized exchange can provide it. And then people can trade that liquidity back and forth. And if you provide liquidity, you can earn interest for being a, an LP or a liquidity provider to a decentralized exchange. So that's when yeah. I remember you telling me one time that if you have a certain amount of ETH, yep. you can do these special things. Yeah. Right? It, like if, borrow against it or like uh, contribute it Be a protocol, to, something or other. You could borrow against it, you could stake it, or you could LP it. Yeah. Those would be three different ways to earn interest on ETH. Is that worth it to be like an LP? Is 3.5% worth it to you? What are the other ones paying? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. And this is what's interesting is as the cycle progresses, so do those APYs. And new protocols will launch that'll be like, well, if you stake with us, we pay you that flat three and a half percent. But we also, we're like a startup and we're going to issue you our token on top of it. And our token is set to be to the moon. And we're going to issue a million tokens a day to, and we're going to spread it across all the people who use our protocol. And so now you'll see the base rate is 3.5%, but the total rate is 85% APY. And that extra ridiculous number comes from their token. And what you can do, though, is you can do what's called farming and dumping, which is every day, every week, or every month, whatever time frame you want to do it, go withdraw that interest in their token and sell it. Sell it for more ETH, sell it for Bitcoin, sell it for whatever you want, and farm and dump it. Now, that protocol will incentivize you to lock up their token. They'll say, oh, that 85% that you're earning on top of your 3%, if you lock it, you can earn 185%. And you'll be like, yeah, I'm going to lock it. And this is where things get go sideways in crypto. If you can stick to your guns in terms of like, when you see these numbers get stupid, you can avoid it. You can just farm and dump that. That 85% was fine. You didn't need 185. And you're still making 85. That's pretty freaking epic. How do you switch your brain <laughs> to be like, oh, yeah, I understand fear and greed is real. Yeah. I understand everyone's going to go this way and I want to go that way. Yeah. But how do you actually do that in reality? Yeah. The hardest thing, I mean, the lesson I've had to learn the hard way, too, is that when all of these income generating opportunities when the percent APYs start to go vertical this is like a chapter of the cycle it'll be about six to eight months and you can earn good interest on it but you're also timing it because you got to get out before everyone else gets out it becomes a ponzi it's it's like a small window of opportunity and so you you have to really think about like, are you here playing the long game? Do you recognize, hey, we're at this moment in the cycle that things are going to get wild. I'm going to try to get as much out of it as I can during that time. But I'm also not going to risk like my core assets. But for me personally, a rule, I don't put my Bitcoin at risk. There's ways I could do it. I don't do it. Hard stop. With my ETH, half of my ETH is I solo stake it, which is the that's the, it's the risk free rate in ethereum half of it the other half of it i get a little crazy with and that all represents 90% of my portfolio so all this crazy stuff we talk about like a lot of it is very i think very in a very safe place do i like to go have fun trying to earn all that apy when shit gets crazy and test all these new things yeah the reality is like there's some opportunities in there too but it's kind of like gambling you have to it have, like, this is what I'm going to put towards this. I'm going to walk away if it doesn't yeah. do what it does. But you also want to take some profit along the way. I'd definitely take profit. Huge yes to that. But also, I'd, I'd correlate it more to trading. Trading might be like gambling. I gambling. should define. So, for me, gambling is playing poker, which I have yeah. an edge. Okay. Gam I don't actually, get, as you know, I don't gamble that much. Uh -huh. I won't put a lot into no blackjack. an unknown. 
you've got a slight edge in blackjack. Sure. Sometimes. Okay, depending. so gambling has. Okay, so gambling can have some edge. You're saying. I see. Yeah. Okay, so in, by your definition, it's gambling, but also you like you could the more time you spend, the more due diligence you do, the more systems and like rules you have in place. Like I don't know if you've met many traders. Like the best traders have very strict rules about how they enter positions, what percentage they are willing to allocate, how they get in and out of positions. And they invented these rules themselves and they follow them very strictly. You can do that in crypto and be very successful, especially during that manic chapter that I think is coming again. How much time do you think you'd need to um, put into finding these opportunities or is it literally tagged to APY? Once it goes crazy, then you're getting in. The way I do it is like every morning I hop on crypto Twitter and I just scroll through and see what people are chatting about, see what protocols are talking about. I have a list I can share with you of like it's 800 people I follow in crypto that are just talking about cool new stuff. And that's where I find that's like the beginning of my rabbit hole of, of the day in some ways. If someone's talking about 800 percent APY, I'm going to click and just see what's up. It doesn't mean I'm going to invest. I mean, I'm definitely not going to invest right away. But yeah, that's kind of how it starts for me. The, lately, the higher the percent, the more unlikely I am. I also like to stick to, I, I, I put on blinders to a lot of things in crypto. Even to this day, like Solana is a big chain. Lots of people have Sol, have invested in Sol, even for multiple cycles now. I don't have any. I've never even used it. And that's not because I don't think maybe there's something interesting happening there. I just, I don't, it's too much of a rabbit hole that I don't have time for. Like I have a lot of, a lot of other shit to to look at, I guess. So the rabbit hole. Yeah. The rabbit hole is deep. Yeah. Is long, is winding. You're deep into crypto. You love it. Yeah. Where invest is, we want assets. Mm -hmm. How much down the rabbit hole do we need to go to be comfortable with this asset and to make good decisions with it? Mm. First. I don't want to sit there every morning no. and read 800 threads. Like, that doesn't sound fun to me. Yeah. That sounds fun to you. But, sure. like, I don't want to be a dummy and do nothing. So, no. like, what do you think is the recommendation for someone like us to say, like, hey, I think you should learn these basics or maybe once a month or, like, what? how, how do we keep in touch with crypto without being? Okay. Well, let me, let, me, let me build an analogy then because I would, I would wager that at some point the two of you have had a conversation about deal flow. How do we get more deal flow? What's our system going to be for getting more deal flow? That's sort that's my list. My Twitter list is like my deal flow, my crypto deal flow. I'm not a I'm not an angel investor or a VC. I'm like investing in public crypto assets. So that's like my deal flow system. I don't think it's that different than investing in any other category. How deep you want to go, how much deal flow you want, how much time you want to spend on due diligence in each one. Maybe it just depends on how much you're enjoying it how much you're making on it. I would say though, you should really, I, I would spend my time on the core protocols. Understand Ethereum, understand Bitcoin, because it's gonna be the majority of your portfolio and everything that's been built since has been built on that. So like building that strong foundation, I think is vital. Then everything else will make sense. You'll see what these guys are doing with their weird lockup thing or their reward token. And you'll be like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I get that because I've seen I've seen this before. And most of them are built on ETH, so you can't just say, oh, if it's on ETH, then it's more interesting. You still need to dig way deeper, right? You'll start to understand how the layers work. So crypto is being built out in layers. Ethereum, when it comes to chains that can handle general purpose, I'm trying not to use big or jargon, but it's hard. I mean, general purpose chains, like Bitcoin is only trying to be money. Ethereum is trying to be a platform for building financial tools on top of with all of these chains they have they all have scaling problems even in uh the year in 1999 we thought web the the, the internet was going to be this incredible investment opportunity and none of it could scale that's probably why i mean there was a bubble but also like it, none of it would have been able to scale to where we're at today anyway nothing good came out of it so it's fine yeah i mean we got the fang we got the fang companies right and They've all figured out how to scale. That's basically what they've done since that time and now is they figured out how to handle scale. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum and everything else is going through that same trajectory right now. And it's being built out in layers. So there's all these layer twos. I mentioned optimism a little bit ago. It's 
probably just like a jargon word right now, but it's a layer two on top of Ethereum. It uses Ethereum only for security, and but everything else happens on Optimism really fast and really cheap, but it uses Ethereum only for its security system. And there's a lot of layer twos being built. There's even layer threes and layer fours probably to help make everything fast and cheap. But if you understood Ethereum and why it doesn't scale, then all that other stuff would make a lot of sense to you too. So that going back to that, like understanding the foundation, that's where I would put my time. So I feel like I'm going to try to start layering, right? Like, mm. so I, I know how to get a wallet. I know how to buy. Yeah. I'm sure there's something about gas fees I probably should know about mm. whatever. We can I can, talk gas fees, We yeah. can work around that. Then I start to think about, okay, what's my portfolio split? I understand a bit about which platform and what protocols each one's doing. Mm. And then you can like, double into the staking and then it's probably the opportunity of the assets that sounds like it may be the progression of yeah so maybe think about um there's going to be these there's going to be the base chains the bitcoins the ethereums then there's going to be dApps or decentralized applications are built on top of ethereum and these are like we looked at compound compound is a dap it's a decentralized application and then compound issues a token and then the token is like the voting it's the way you invest in Compound itself. If you think Compound has a future and that it's making, you can even look at the revenue Compound is earning and what they're spending and their P&L. Like it's all public information. You could decide to invest in Compound. That would be like, I'd say investing in Compound would be kind of like you're a venture capitalist investor. Investing in like Ethereum would be like you're invest like I don't want to call it index fund, maybe like a NASDAQ investor. And then Bitcoin is like digital gold. In, in its early days. And some of those, and there are those layer twos like Optimism, you could buy the OP token. It's, if you just think, man, Ethereum is slow and the future of using this, is, we need it to be fast. Optimism is building something called, they call the super chain so that anyone can build layer twos on top of Ethereum that integrate together and use Ethereum as security. If you think that's the narrative that you want to chase, you could invest in Optimism itself. All of those kind of opportunities, that would be another like, a VC investment. Maybe Compound would be like an angel investment if you wanted to kind of like layer and think about it in those ways. And all of these things, I put them personally in like a 10% of my portfolio bucket. And I've seen you put this out that you have a checklist yeah. of new projects. Um, have you thought about going and interviewing these people and talking to them about uh -huh. what they're doing? Not interviewing them myself, but I do that in two ways. The first is one of the very first things I do no matter in any opportunity or new rabbit hole I want to go down is I find interviews with the founder. It's literally one of my first steps and it's the most fun step, I think. And I, I share lots of those clips on the BitLift socials because uh, I listen to it and I snip them out. But also the second thing is while I'm doing my due diligence, almost all of them have like a community discord or a community telegram, which is just where they like everyone who's using this protocol and or and or working on it even the like funds and whatnot that are involved with them, they're all hanging out in there. So as I'm learning about it, I'll fling questions into that community and the people who are working on it will answer you. So I don't do the traditional like angel investment style, like, oh, go have coffee with the founder. I think that's like an antiquated, like good old boys network thing anyway. I, I disagree. <laughs> <laughs> so one of the investor groups we used to be a part of one of the value adds was they would get the people coming in and pitch us. And we got pitched by billionaires and all sorts of people. And it was amazing to me, just as a human, I've, my background's in sales. So I, I study people. That's what I do. Uh -huh. And I'm just like, this is a hard pass. Mm. And the amount of smart people with way more money than me that were like all in on yes. X, Y, and Z after yeah. hearing and getting to ask their own questions. Mm. It was quite cool. Yeah. So I wonder how many people in your community, I'd be one of them, uh. that would say, hey, we're getting the compound guys on. Let's yeah. talk to them. Sure. Hey, if and we can move some jump, weight, you, and then what do you, how much off. weight are you pushing around? And then maybe they'll hop on our call. Exactly. Yeah. So that's one of the groups I was in. There was $12 billion in liquidity. So that one was pretty good. This yeah. one was smaller and newer. Mm -hmm. I think the largest... At the time we were in, it's probably bigger now. I think the largest check they wrote combined was 30 million. So that was like pretty sizable yeah. when you're raising. Most of these guys were raising, I don't know what, 
some of them were raising like a hundred million, but sometimes okay. real estate stuff or mostly well, real estate, stuff? the VC stuff we weren't really interested in. It was yeah. more cash flowing. So yeah, that was that was actually a crypto mining project that we sure. were we'd committed to, but they never called our capital, which was kind of weird. Mm-hmm. That would have been nice instead of the hundred we put elsewhere that failed. <laughs> <laughs> that probably would have turned out okay. I'm not opposed to it. And if I did, I'd like to, I mean, meeting and even just the networking would be fun and interesting. But yeah, I mean, he, I listen to p- interviews with the founders all the time and I'm like, hard no. Just listening to a, p- a podcast with them. It happens all the time. And then there's sometimes where I'm like, just lit the fuck up after listening to how passionate some of these guys are. But then you got to be careful too, because then that's where all the scammers are when you can feel that energy coming off of them, right? That's something I've learned the hard way as well. So I think for the listeners that have made it all the way to the end, yes. they get to hear a Gerb's prediction. Uh, I've seen you tracking the election coming up. Uh-huh. Uh, I've heard friends talking about the interest rates are going down probably yep. because they want to make it look good for the public. They want everybody to be happy when they're voting. So, I mean, that's a positive that we think is coming to the banking world. Mm-hmm. So you're tracking the election as a mark in your, your spreadsheets. What's going to happen? Do we get our money ready to buy in the dip or do you, are we going to the moon because they're going to back some crazy crypto thing that helps it explode? Yeah. Tell me. So, yeah, you saw on the chart, I have a, a vertical line of when the when election day is. And I just thought that it was interesting that it correlates almost exactly with six months after the halving in every previous cycle, we've started our big bull market. And the halving is a four-year cycle. The election is a four-year cycle. I've heard that we're having, like, we're kind of reaching this part in the world where, like, all these cycles are kind of coming into sync with each other in this four-year cycle. And it's not just a crypto thing anymore. Hey, maybe the reason crypto actually moons every four years is because the market gets some clarity over who the next president is, and then it just goes up. Maybe the halving has nothing to do with it. Uh, I don't believe that, but maybe, you know, it's just I noticed that the election is it happens to be dated at the same time that I think we're going to break out of this kind of this range that we're trading in right now. So you got to buy before the election and get the bump or and all of the above put in a limit order in case the market doesn't get what it wants. But here's here's the thing what I've discovered over time is that the markets love clarity it doesn't, they don't actually care. I mean, they, it does care whether like red or blue wins the game. There will be a momentary boom or bust based on who wins. But what the market really loves is just knowing what to do next. Like now, okay, we for the next four years, this is going to be our president. Now we can put together a plan. And I think the market likes that more than anything. So I'd throw out there, if blue team wins, we might dump. And I would buy that dip all day. If red team wins, we might freaking moon and we might miss our chance. Both are 50-50, literally. But how come you don't know exactly what's going to happen <laughs> to the millisecond? Come on, man. Uh, uh, have you guys heard of stock to flow or have you seen that yet? It's, it's actually the chart I was showing you a little earlier was the stock to flow model. It's something I've been following for a long time. Stock to flow, it's a commodities formula based on The stock, meaning how much of a commodity already exists in the world, like let's say gold, how much gold has been dug up. They know in tons how much gold there is. And then flow, how much new gold is being pumped out of the ground every year. And I think gold is, its flow is like 2% or something like that. And this ratio of stock to flow, gold has the highest stock to flow ratio of any other metal. And it's the reason why gold is used as money for thousands of years. (laughs) It's because it can very predictably, they know that only about 2% more is going to be created every year. This is sort of what Satoshi hacked in this weird way by creating this very specific having issuance formula over time. And what this guy Plan B discovered is that you can take the stock to flow formula, apply it to Bitcoin, and it freakishly maps to it like magic. So this purple line is the stock to flow of Bitcoin. And the colorful one is the price. And you see every four years, it, it's going to get that major spike. Here was the spike in end of 2012. Here's the spike in 2016. 
2020. And you see, for example, in 2013, it blew past the stock to flow formula. Right now, we sort of pegged it almost to a T in this last cycle, which was interesting. And now it's been two cycles of people knowing the stock to flow formula. So anyway, when you mentioned like, how, why don't I know to the millisecond? There are people working on knowing to the millisecond. Um, it actually maps really well. Now, do we get like extreme greed and extreme fear like along that? Yes, we do. And there's no way to really account for that. But I, I think it works well. And this is not my, my prediction. This is Plan B's prediction based on stock to flow. He calls 530K Bitcoin price this cycle. That's what stock to flow calls for right now. Might we just tag it and bounce off? Are we going to blow, have a, what I've called previously a blow off top, like we did in the previous two cycles? Maybe. But I'd put my money on, if I had a goal, I'd put my money on 500 being like the, the highest it could possibly go, which is a 10x from right now. Time to buy some more Bitcoin before it goes boom. Before we go, tell me, so where are you at on your journey in terms of you you have an exchange where you buy Bitcoin only, maybe some ETH, maybe some Soul. Where are we on that? And then what would be maybe like next steps? What are you thinking might be next steps? We've got two places we can buy. Okay, cool. Uh, we've got our cold storage. Yeah. Which Are you using the cold storage yet? I haven't put it on there yet. Okay. Because... It's scary. I decided to be cool and stake it on Coinbase. And uh. then I learned from you that that probably is not the best it might... way to stake it. I could do better. You could do better. So now I have unstaked it. So I need to move it. Mm. We got some ETH and some Bitcoin. Okay. Uh, we bought a hundred bucks of Solana like two years ago and it's worth nothing. So, you know, mm. that went to like five bucks. Um... You might break even here soon. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think the next step is to decide how much of our portfolio we want to assign to crypto mm -hmm. and put some buy orders in and then probably get some more to hedge against other assets, inflation, try ride the market a little, actually be a holder, hold, hodler, hodler. <laughs> what do you think? Yeah. I'm kind of interested in turning active income into a portion of Bitcoin buys. And mm. that's why I was asking before, do you just leave cash in the exchange or whatever ready with your limit orders? Yes. So I feel like that could be a path forward as active income coming in. Some could just flow and be ready for buy orders, basically. Yep. DCA in over time. Yeah. That could be interesting. Uh, it also, now you've showed me this kind of crossover between real assets and crypto. That's got me thinking on a whole other level. Yeah. But also maybe talking to you offline about interviewing people, getting a group together to potentially invest or just ask questions mm -hmm. of these newer projects. I think I'd be super interested in that. Cool. We can co We can get that real assets guy on and uh, co-host the pod and grill him. That, that'd be fun. Yeah. That that'd be, be really fun. But there's so much... There's so much of that that's in between. Like we've had so much trouble over the years moving money internationally. Yeah. That even what you were saying about buy five hundred of Bit five hundred dollars of Bitcoin, send it to someone. Yeah. Cost pennies. It's like actually the shit we've had to deal with over the last decade is ridiculous. The amount of money we've paid out and the amount of time we've lost moving money, excuse me, is ridiculous. Yeah. So I'd love to yeah, there's a few jump off points here. Cool. Yeah. I always, th my tagline for BitLift since the beginning has been we don't just stack crypto, we use it. So, like, even though what I want to just do is keep stacking it, like, I think it's so important to use it. Yeah, I don't want to spend my Bitcoin because now I have less Bitcoin. But if you don't use it, you don't, you're missing out on like understanding it at its core. It's like being a real estate investor and like not having a tool belt. Like, at some point, you got to know what it is you're investing in. And I think using it is fun. You, you can have both too. You can have your investment portfolio and then we can set you guys up with like a hot wallet, which is a wallet where you're not jumping through all these hoops with like writing down all your words and like protecting them on geographic, like chipping it into stone. You know, we can avoid that part with some of your money and just use things, try things, poke around, 
get rugged and get robbed. Like, that'll happen. You got to do that at least once. Like, Well, we've done that in the real world. They... Why not do it in the crypto world? <laughs> no. And there were rappers involved, and it was cannabis. It's a oh. safe bet. <laughs> exactly. Hey, I mean, crypto is no different. Those same guys are probably in crypto now. So, all right, cool. Well, you know where to find me uh, as your journey continues. We can do a follow-up at some point when with some fresh set of questions, and I look forward to it. Yeah, this was fun. Thanks, dude.